so in the first kind of lecture, I gave you an introduction about the motivation, about why we should be interested, or why is it important to think about robustness uh, to assumptions that go into statistical probabilistic models. Um, and so there was uh, some nice questions kind of during the break. I thought I'd just kind of briefly pick up on. So, so one thing is I should say is that the stuff I talked about at the, the end is about the learn about learning, yeah, about model fitting, yeah. And so there's an what I'm saying is 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 really when you're fitting your models to data, especially in a in a some kind of semi-automated machine learning approach, it's useful to kind of build in inherent robustness into the models. It, within all of this, I should say, is within the context of a kind of a probability uh, a model. And the reason is, is that the, the probability a model assumes that it's got the distribution correct. Yeah. So if it sees an observation that has very low kind of probability, then in some sense it will kind of try and correct itself uh, uh, to track that. So what I'm talking about initially and with the, in the process of the score functions is using kind of robust likelihoods or distributions that mean that the model kind of learns a little bit less on individuals, tries to really kind of stick where the bulk of the data is. Okay. There's a, there was a, a question about prediction, yeah, about the kind of the issue of, of prediction. Like formally, in a kind of the Bayesian framework, prediction just follows, just kind of flows through naturally. It's just a kind of a marginalization. So under the joint distribution. And so if you've built a joint distribution, which is outlier prone, i.e. allows for the probability of generating outliers, uh, then that should flow through for, for prediction. But there's, there's an additional part which will come on to talk about now, which is this, you know, after you've done your best possible, you know, you've done everything possible, you know, in building a robust model, you know, you've thought about the prior, you've put heavy-tailed likelihood or outlier prone likelihoods, you know, there's this kind of additional levels of uncertainty that one might wish to, to, to be concerned about. Uh, and, that, and that's what we'll kind of really cover now. So there's another question somebody asked me about a little bit kind of more formally about what did I mean by, you know, ba all of Bayesian statistics is model-based, yeah? And by that I mean that Bayesian statistics is kind of generative, yeah? Formally, you have to be able to generate data under your model. And so there's a, there's kind of one kind of question to think about, yeah? Very kind of a, so there's a very kind of simple question or, or illustration for this, yeah? So suppose I want to estimate the median heights of machine people that would attend a machine learning summer school. Yeah? So I say, right, I want to estimate the median of the heights of students, of the populations of students or individuals that would attain. Yeah? And so in a non-Bayesian framework, if I'm a statistician, I would, do, I, would, I would measure all of you or a subsample of you. And I would say, take the midpoint and provide that as my estimate of the median. Yeah. If you're a Bayesian, you would say, okay, I might have prior beliefs about the median height of a summer, you know, if this was of interest to you, yeah. Uh, you, but you have a prior belief on what that median is. Okay. So this, you've got a very well-defined quantity, the median, and I've got a very well-defined prior, my prior beliefs about where that median of the true population is. Yeah. How do you do Bayesian learning? That's it. How does a Bayesian estimate, do estimate, my English is awful, how does a Bayesian estimate a median? Yeah, I'll leave that, think about it. Yeah. If, you, if you have an answer, you, uh, talk to me about it, because I'd like to know. Yeah. And it, it just, what it illustrates is, is, is is the kind of the constraints of being formally Bayesian. Yeah, there are, there are constraints that come with defining a joint probability distribution. Yeah? 
and there are real benefits from it. The benefits we know about, you get coherent updating, we know how to accommodate uncertainty formally through joint probability statements, but there are certain kind of constraints. And so just think about how would you, how if you've got prior, strong prior beliefs about the median, I give you a whole load of observations and I say, right, do some Bayesian updating. You know, what would you do? Okay, that's a question for you. Okay, so for this part of the talk, I'm going to move on and talk uh, about this idea of sensitivity to the prior. And I would point you, as I said, to the review articles. There's a, a whole load of references at the end of the slides about, uh, about other papers in this field. Okay. So I talked before about how to do kind of outlier prone, the student versus Gaussian is a simple case of an outlier prone likelihood and why that's a good thing. Um, but the majority of papers dealing with, with robustness in probabilistic models, so to deal with the prior. It's not really surprising when you think about it. Um, in many situations, people feel that the prior is more uncertain in a sense than the likelihood. You know, in classification problems, the likelihood is in some sense predefined as binomial or Bernoulli. Yeah. In regression problems, one might be able to entertain the idea of a student or some kind of sampling distribution. And it's really the likelihood, uh, the prior part, which is the more uncertain aspect. Of course, the other reason why people in the Bayesian literature concentrated on sensitivity and robustness to prior specification is because that was the thing that they were being uh, most grilled about. Yeah? Where does the prior come from? The major objection, historically, and contrast to non-Bayesian approaches, is in the use of the prior to kind of formally update. Okay. And the, the final part to note is, of course, is that the prior defines uh, the likelihood. So if you, if you change your likelihood, then you need to, you almost certainly need to change your prior because of the interpretation. Yeah? What does the prior mean? It's the probability of the parameters in, in the likelihood. Yeah? Your prior beliefs about the setting of the parameters in the likelihood. Okay. So uh, one way of dealing with prior sensitivity is to try and think of something that's inherently robust or, say, non-informative. This is all the, the historical work of, say, people like Jeffries and work in the objective Bayes uh, literature, kind of non-informative, some idea of reference priors, or there's a literature in Maxent, maximum entry priors. This idea that, um, that what we want to do is a prior that has minimal influence on the data, allow the data to speak for themselves. Yeah. Uh, the challenge here really is that a non-informative prior for one question might be highly influential for another. And the, the kind of the canonical example of that is model choice. Yeah, is that if I fit a regression problem where I say, oh, these variables are important. Say these four variables are important. You know, go and fit me a, go and fit me a model or do Bayesian learning. And you say, well, I'm going to adopt a flat prior on the parameters because I don't want it to influence. And then I say, well, now entertain a model choice criteria. So maybe one of those variables you wanted to exclude from the model, yes or no, and set that up within your Bayesian framework. Then the non-informative prior within the fixed model framework becomes maximally informative when you start to think of model choice. So, uh, so non-informative priors are in some sense contextual. Yeah, and we need to kind of be aware of that. Okay, so... but. Perhaps the cleanest way or the clearest way that people have worked is the idea of we're going to start with an operational model. So I'm going to build that to the best of my ability. I'm going to you know, build my machine learning model, best of my ability, and then ex post, like having fit the model to the data and applied it in terms of prediction or learning about some underlying uh, dependent structure in nature. What we want to do is explore sensitivity of answers to perturbations around the prior by our class of distribution functions. And when I say answers, what do I mean formally? I'm going to talk about posterior quantities of interest, namely expectations yeah, or functionals under the posterior distribution. So most questions that you ask with a, a statistical model can be answered, uh, can be given as functionals. 
yeah, where G is some uh, is some loss or cost function, and P of theta given x is the posterior distribution. So if you ask me the posterior mean, credible intervals, predictions, quantiles, all of these you can you can write down as functionals. Okay. <coughs> And what we want to do is to look at sensitivity to answers, i.e. functionals here, to changes in the prior that went into this posterior distribution. So we can think of these changes as perturbations, neighbourhoods around the model space, uh, that might lead you to very, very different conclusions. And those perturbations are either historically classed as local or global. Yeah? And so local approaches, which I'm not going to cover here, talk about functional derivatives of the posterior model of interest with respect to perturbations around the baseline. Okay? So you have your model. Remember I said think of your model as a point in a space of distribution functions. Yeah? You've got a joint probability model that you've ended up with bang, it's a single distribution function. And what we can do is we can look at derivatives of that yeah, and look for, uh, look for directions through this kind of, uh, through the model space, which are, say, uh, maximally sensitive. What we're going to do is we're going to focus on, on global, what's so-called uh, global approaches. And so by a global approach, we're just going to, you should entertain the following cartoon, yeah? That you have sat down, you're, you know, you're a signed up Bayesian, you know, you've sat down with your colleagues, or you fit your model to the, to the data, and you've, you've, here it is, P0, yeah? That's, that's the model that you're going to, that's your operational model, okay? It's the one that you're going to use to do prediction, or is the one that you're going to use to, say, decide which patient gets which treatment? Yeah? Or use to decide, should I go out and do another experiment, validate the data, go and gather more data? Yeah? It's my working model. And the notion of robustness is we, I, want to def, I want to specify a class of other models that are in some sense centered on your working model. Yeah? And what I, what I want to do, or, or the, the task to do, is to uh, look at the sensitivity of this thing within that class. So say psi is prediction error. Yeah? Then what I would like to know is that if I move a little bit in model space, yeah, does my prediction accuracy fall off a cliff? Yeah, that would be informative to me. Yeah? So it says maybe I've overtrained on the data. Okay. Or if I'm using this model to predict which patient should get which drug, if I perturb the model a little bit and it suddenly rapidly changes the classification assignment for different individuals, then I would want to know. Or if it tells me that this drug had a no effect relative to a positive effect. So when we're talking about robustness for the rest of this lecture, the, what we want to do is I want to do, we're going to think about this scenario. Okay? And in order to do this, we're clearly going to need to do a couple of things. First of all, I'm going to need to define a neighborhood or class of distributions, gamma, which has, in some, you can think of it has some radius. Yeah? In fact, we're going to define like a ball of distribution functions which has some particular radius, some locality around your, your current working model. And what I want to do is I want to explore the variation in the thing that you're interested in yeah, within that ball, within that class. So two things that one might be interested in is what is the best and what is the worst thing that could happen to you yeah, within that neighborhood. So if you had psi here was misclassification error, I could look for all distribution functions or all priors within the ball or within the class gamma, what is the best classifier, potential classifier I have, and what is the worst? Okay. 
Now, in order to do this, the challenge is, of course, you need to define this neighborhood function that's going to allow you to answer those types of questions. While, you know, while accommodating the fact that you want ease of specification, you want some natural kind of divergence measure for defining that class of models. Again, this notion that you've heard me mention it a couple of times. I think of this as like shaking your model. Yeah? Think of like robustness as shaking your model. If I, if I take your model, which is this point in distribution, let M denote the space of all joint distributions. Yeah? So your model just sits there somewhere in this space. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and shake it up a bit. Yeah? And by shake it up, I'm going to, you know, that's the informal thing. Yeah, formally, I'm going to mean that I'm going to perturb it within a neighborhood, and I'm going to see what happens. Yeah? And what hopefully I'll persuade you is that you can do this in a kind of a systematic way. OK. So the kind of the art and the science of choosing those neighborhood functions is that we want the class to be easy to work with. Yeah? You don't want to define some distributional class or class of distributions, rather, which makes it non-tractable. So you want them to be easy to interpret, to explain to individuals what you're doing. Yeah? You want them to be easy to handle computationally. Yeah? This is, in some senses, a, non, a non-parametric problem. That's a, an infinite dimensional space. Yeah? It's, a, it's a space of distribution functions, or a class of distribution functions. Okay. In terms of defining that neighborhood, of course, we want it to be wide enough. You know, having defined the form of the neighborhood, you need to define the radius. How far out do I go from my baseline model? How much kind of wiggle? How much shaking do I do? Yeah. You want it to be wide enough to cover reasonable uncertainty, but not so wide as to be totally implausible. Yeah. And obviously, you want it to be able to adapt to arbitrary high dimensions. So I would just mention like one important way of kind of building these neighborhood structures is via mixture models. And these were known as like epsilon contamination neighborhoods. So what's an epsilon neighborhood contamination? It says what I'm going to do is a posteriori take my current working model P0 and I'm going to assume a kind of an outlier, yeah, that actually the data came with probability 1 minus epsilon from my current working model. But then there's an additional, there's this kind of external amount of uncertainty that it was generated from some other contamination class. And you wanted to restrict the class of contaminant machine learning models or distributions that it's not so big. Yeah. Again, these are kind of qualitative descriptions. But for example, you might want to say, well, I believe that a contaminant model would still be unimodal. Yeah. So if my predictive model is unimodal, it has a single kind of a mode of prediction, I wouldn't want to entertain models that would allow for arbitrary kind of multimodality. And a nice feature of the epsilon contamination class of priors is that the posterior has a, has a mixture form. So if the prior is a kind of a mixture, says there's a potential contamination from something external, then the posterior also has a, um, has a mixture form. And so what this would say is that the model that I should end up working with, or at least considering, has a weighted form of a, an updated weight on the model that I was going to use, yeah, or rather a down weighting. So this weight would be one if you had total faith in your model. Uh, this weight is going to be slightly is going to be less than one, yeah, and it's going to form a, a one minus weight is going to get shifted over onto this model. And the weights are going to be given by the kind of the marginal likelihood or the probability of, of the data under the contamination class and under the posterior. So this, in a sense, is just kind of an additional level of Bayesian updating that takes into account 
possible contaminations of models. There are many other, and I just refer the reader to the reader, I refer you <laughs> to the collection of uh, papers that occur in these, uh, uh, these listed articles. Um, so these kind of classes of priors and classes of uh, you know, models working with this were kind of widely studied in like the, the, the 90s and 2000s. And then as I said, kind of in some sense, interest tailored off a bit. But in an independent kind of research thread, people in robust control, so signal processing uh, researchers and subsequently researchers in econometrics started studying very kind of similar notions of robustness. So again, what they've considered is the idea of a local, of a, a working operational model and some neighborhood of model space for which if we shake the model a bit, yeah, they're interested in what happens. So you can see why, uh, if you're interested in robust control or control theory, why this would be important. Yeah. So control theory tries to keep some process in some stable regime. Yeah. If you're doing probabilistic control theory, it assumes some kind of distribution or some uncertainty. And so what you might worry about is that, well, if my assumptions were wrong, yeah, if nature was buffering me, yeah, in a, you know, was hitting me with stochastic noise that was quite, a, was a little bit different to what I was assuming, can I still maintain myself within a stable regime? Okay. So that was the motivation for control theory. Econometr econometricians, of course, are interested in it by saying, well, we make kind of long-term, say, forecasts or short-term forecasts of stock prices, you know, these are, again, if we're using probability models, I might worry about what's the worst thing that could happen to my portfolio, you know, if I just happen to get the assumptions wrong. Yeah. Can I protect myself against something disastrous happening to my, my working model or the, the use of my working model? So the original work in this area was by Whittle, and Whittle has a nice book on this. So it was really kind of Whittle that kind of, uh, there's a signal processing who developed the idea of robust control. Yeah. And as I said here, it really concerns the idea of optimal interventions, kind of uh, strategies, so as to maintain the process within some stable regime. Okay. And what they were able to show or what Whittle was able to show is that in the case of like a Gaussian state space model, so if you have a, a, a standard kind of Gaussian uh, a time series model, that you can answer these questions in closed form. There's a kind of tractable set of solutions. Okay. Really building upon this work, uh, Hansen and Sargent in a number of influential papers starting in the kind of 2000s, generalize this idea yeah, to kind of principally macroeconomic time series. So Hansen is the Hansen of uh, Peter Hansen, who just recently received the Nobel uh, Prize. And they have a very good book on, uh, which I referenced somewhere further down, on robustness. So they have a whole book on, on robustness that deals precisely with, with this uh, uh, question, 2008 book. Okay, and so as I said, I think you know all of you have this notion of the cartoon of my model as a point in space in this neighborhood. So we need to define what the neighborhood is, and we need to define what quantity we're going to examine within the neighborhood. Okay, and so following on from kind of Whittle, Hansen, and Sargent, what we're going to dis look at is something called the local minimax act within a callback Leibler neighborhood of the posterior. Okay, I want to spend a little bit of time because this is really, it's like really important we understand what we're looking at here. So I'm going to look at what's the worst thing that can happen to you. Yeah, if we assume that, that psi, take, for, to fix in our minds, let's assume psi is misclassification error. Yeah? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, What's the worst thing that can happen to you yeah, for a, a, a model 
that's contained within this ball gamma around my current working model. Okay, so again with my cartoon here, here's my working model. I'm going to look at the misclassification error rates within a class of models around it, and I'm going to look at the worst misclassification error rate. And of course, if, if that misclassification error rate is, is, is huge, I might be concerned about you know, stability because I've just, I've just changed my model perhaps a little bit and the misclassification at, at rate has changed dramatically. And looking at that kind of the worst possible outcome is a minimax outcome and constraining it within the neighborhood makes it local. Yeah? You know, if you set the neighborhood size, if you set that kind of ball of distributions to cover the whole space, you'd be back into the territory of Wald and Minimax, yeah? What's the worst possible thing that could happen to me, yeah? And the interesting thing about why classically Minimax is not often applied in, in decision theory is that it's, you know, almost pathologically uh, um, pessimistic. Yeah, it says, oh, you know, what's the absolute worst possible thing that could, you know, somebody that lived their life according to Minimax would, like, never get out of bed. Yeah? <laughs> I mean, you'd say, oh, goodness, you know, if I get out of bed, I might fall over, and then I, but if, I, <laughs> if I stay in bed, no one's going to feed me. <laughs> well, but, I mean, you imagine, you know, imagine having a friend that lived their life according to Minimax. It would be, <laughs> it would be interesting, yeah, and disastrous, yeah. So, but the, the nice thing here is that, is that we're going to use the current working model as, as information, yeah? So classically, Minimax says, just look over the space of all possible models and choose me the worst possible, tell me what's the worst thing that could happen. So here the notion is, right, you know, I've actually done a lot of work. You know, I've, I've got my data, I've looked at it, I've analyzed it, I've fit my model. And so I think that that's a pretty good, you know, a pretty good uh, representation of the underlying system. But, you know, what I, I, I want to, I'm concerned, of course, so I'd like to, you know, all those assumptions that went into the model when I dropped those variables and I selected those other ones and when I fit it with a normal and I put a hierarchical there and I assumed it was Markov. All of those things, all of those ingredients, you know, kind of play on your mind. And so you, you take this as a good working model, but you want to explore what could happen in the neighborhood. And as I said, one thing you can explore is what's the worst possible thing. What's the local, the minimax act. Okay, so that's defined the object of which we're going to characterize. We're going to characterize what's the worst outcome that can occur to you. And so this formally defines the posterior distribution, well, for some model and uh, a loss function, yeah? uh, a negative reward function. And for reasons that I'll explain later, the, the neighborhood is going to be defined via a callback Leibler ball. Okay, so we're going to use an information measure or divergence around your current working model. Yeah, and we know callback Leibler is not symmetric, and so it's important, especially from what follows in this lecture, that we that we pin down uh, which uh, which direction we're looking at, which divergence we're looking at. The callback Leibler that we're going to define is the divergence of your current working model from some, un some other distribution within that ball. Yeah. In, in some sense, well, in many sense, this is the kind of more natural way of, to specify this. Okay. Because this callback Leibler looks like an expectation, yeah? It looks like an average under pi of theta, this is a distribution, of this log ratio. Yeah. So it kind of says to me, suppose nature, you know, I fit my model here. This is you. You're sitting with that in your computer. But suppose nature is actually throwing me these samples of theta according to pi. Yeah. 
and I could look at the I could look at some loss in terms of the ratio, the log likelihood or log probability ratio. Yeah. So this callback libel looks like an average under what nature is providing you of this kind of log loss. Yeah. And what I want to do is I want to search over all distribution functions within that ball in order to find the one that gives me the worst possible outcome. And then look at that value and make some judgment about whether I do I need to kind of explore further or am I happy. So we can consider your current working model is a useful but approximate uh, representation of the world. And in this part of the, the lecture, we're going to investigate robustness by looking at minimax events, or rather distributions, which are constrained to be within some neighborhood. And in particular, we're going to define the neighborhood using a callback Leibler divergence. And there's going to be an, uh, uh, some parameter C, which is the radius. Yeah, it's how far, in some sense, uh, C represents how confident you are in your model. Yeah? If you really think that you've done a, a great job, yeah, then you'd expect nature or the, you know, to be your real, you, know, you, you, you wouldn't expect the neighborhood to be very large. Yeah? If you were really kind of concerned or you didn't know much or you were kind of worried, then you might expect this neighborhood function uh, to be much larger. So in Hansen and Sargent, they considered Gaussian dynamic state space models. Yeah. And, um, in a, and they showed that for these class of models, there's other things like Kalman filters, there's an explicit form for this thing here. The worst possible outcome yeah, has an explicit closed form, yeah, which is surprising in some sense and, until you see the answer and then you it becomes yeah, intuitive um, and in a follow-up kind of series of papers building on this work yeah, so there's a question of like how does this um, how do we uh, perturb or how do we define this ball? Uh, so I mean the metrics like, of the ball is clear, but how do you exactly change the model or spice the model and then how do you go from one model to another? Yeah. So is that just by changing the hyperparameters basically you know, over the time? So what I'm so this is a good question. So how do we go from the model, the working model that we've got? to this kind of the new model or the, 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 the local minimax model. So what we've defined here, this is the task. I want to define the worst possible thing that can happen within this neighborhood. Okay. This is any arbitrary distribution function. Yeah, but it's in particular, it's an arbitrary distribution function on the parameters that enter into the loss function. Okay, so, so, so this is important um, that this theta is the set of states which enter into the loss function for which you're going to be wanting to protect yourself about. So if we were talking about misclassification, yeah, so if I was driven by misclassification error, then theta would be just a predictive, a posterior predictive. Yeah. If I was interested in, and it would be a marginal, yeah, so it's a marginal, it's, it's the state, yeah, it's the state of the world for which you're going to get your rewards or your losses on. So in, in econometrics, say, 
this would be, this theta would just be the future return price of a stock. Yeah? If I'm working in pharmacogenomics, it would be how you respond with your genetic information to this particular drug. Yeah? And so theta captures the state of the world for which you are going to be kind of judged on, yeah? or for which you will receive losses or get or gains. Yeah? The pi of theta is the marginal probability distribution on those sets of, on the states <coughs> theta, which enter into the loss. Okay. So, if you're having a, if you've got a Bayesian machine learning model, you might have lots of hierarchies and lots of structures in there. But if I tell you, oh, you want to be protected against getting this question wrong, then, then what do you do? Then P0 here represents the marginal probability under your working model on the things of which you care about. I could be a prediction, or it might be estimating a, some kind of effect. Yeah? So, so that's P0. What, I, what, I'm, what do I mean by this space here? It's just the space of all distribution functions. Yeah? So if, the, if I can just define a distribution function yeah, on, on that state theta, yeah, then for any distribution function that you can think of, you can tell me whether this holds or not, more or less. Think of the class of distribution functions, and I can say, so you say, oh, I'm going to propose pi of theta uh, on the marginal set theta, and I'm going to tell you whether this condition holds or not. If that condition holds, it enters into the set. If it doesn't, it doesn't. It goes outside. Hi, yeah. But does this um, model space include all possible parameters that it's under a certain class and all possible classes of models yes. together? Everything. Both of them. Yes. If I write it as such, yes. Yeah, I'm going to define it, yeah, the, the, the gamma to be the space of distribution functions. On the set of, on the, the so think of this as the predictive distribution functions on the, on the events theta for which you are, your model is going to be graded about. You're going to take your model to your boss and say, I've got a machine learning model. He's going to apply it. And then he's going to come back and say, that was terrible. Well, no, I mean, or we could say it's great, yeah? But, but he's going to grade it. Think about it, he's going to grade it in some way, yeah? Now, you're going to be graded on, on things that you don't currently know, yeah? Because if you knew what they were going to be, you, that's what you'd report, yeah? Yeah, and so, so, so Bayesian statistics is about accommodating uncertainty in the things that you don't know, i.e., you don't know the outcome of theta. If you did, you'd know what to do. If I knew the price of a stock tomorrow, yeah, I would, uh, I would know which stocks to buy. I don't know the price <coughs> of st what the stocks will be tomorrow, by definition, because I'm here, yeah? <laughs> if I did, I might not be uh, teaching uh, <laughs> to, to you. Uh, no, actually, I love what I do, so I probably would still be here. But, um, but so here we have, this would be the price, the future price of a stock, yeah? Here's your loss function, how your boss is going to grade your model. Yeah? And what you worry about is that you've got a very particular predictive model for the world, and you want to worry about there might be some local model, some other distribution function that's similar, which has a much worse outcome. And by similar, I'm just going to define the callback Leibler divergence. Then more questions. Hi, yeah. So since you're conditioning all your data, mm. you're really you're really evaluating both your likelihood and your prior. Yes. <clears throat> so yeah. So th that's another good point. I've shifted slightly. When I started off, I was talking about prior robustness. And then and it like I kind of slipped it in there when I started talking about the robust control and Hansen and Sargent that we're talking about posterior robustness. 
So I started off saying, oh, P0 was your prior working model. What happens if your prior wasn't specified? I've now started talking about predictives and marginals. What's interesting is it's going to turn out that they're one and the same. Yeah. When we play this minimax game, yeah? So what I'm going to convince you is that if you play the minimax game with the callback libeler loss, there's a kind of a... There's no distinction between playing this game on the posterior model or playing the game on the prior model. And moreover, that the callback libeler loss is really the only one that you can use to remain what we call coherent. Okay, so here's the game is you give me your model, yeah, and a loss function, and I'm gonna tell you what's the worst possible thing that could happen within that neighborhood of the model. Uh, other questions in setting this up? And the neighborhood is going to be defined, as I said, from the unknown kind of state of nature to the, your current working model. OK. So, so the, the form of what's the worst thing that could happen when the noise is Gaussian and you have a linear kind of a dynamic state space model is kind of was worked out by Whittle and subsequently by a lot of work by Hansen and Sargent and others uh, referenced in their book. And but then more recently, well, 2013 and 2011, it was shown that actually you can play this game for arbitrary probability models. Yeah, so you can give me any p zero. And I'll be able to show you, or at least kind of derive, the form. Sorry. You give me any P0, and I have an estimator for this thing. Yeah, for any baseline model. OK, that was, that was what was shown. And so that kind of uh, is quite re seems quite remarkable. And those papers use results from exponential families and large deviation theory. In fact, what, what we've shown, myself working with one of my students, is that there's actually a really, there's a, a very simple, you know, three-line proof uh, to this that I want to kind of walk you through uh, now. So you provide me with a probability model and the loss function, and I'm going to tell you the form of the worst possible thing that can happen. So the local... Minimax distribution is defined. It's the, it's the argument, which for us is the distribution function contained within the callback live, the ball uh, defined via the callback libel divergence to your model. It's the distribution function that gives me the worst possible expected outcome. You know, the worst thing you can do. Or equally, you could look at the best thing that could happen, yeah? if you're an optimist. Uh, L. A theta quantifies the loss, the negative reward you will receive if the true state is theta. Of course, you don't know what theta is, and therefore you use your model to predict it. And that's, the underlying, that's what underpins uh, decision theory, yeah? is the use of expected losses. It's savage. Uh, we've said this. We're going to take the callback libel divergence. And I've said that, that you can actually turn it out. Okay. And so this is one of the things, when you see the result, you go, oh, yeah, of course, yeah. Um, well, maybe not of course, but um, let pi star a be that distribution function. Okay. Then what we'll show is that the pi star a, the worst possible kind of model, as in the thing that can happen if nature is really providing it according to this, has this following form. It has this exponentiated loss function, the loss that entered into uh, calculating your expected reward, times this, which is your original model. Okay. And lambda is a non-negative real-valued scalar, which is monotone in C. You have a probability model. You have your machine learning model. Yeah? And you're going to be judged on its use. Yeah, and the way you're going to be judged is by this loss function. 
Yeah? That tells me uh, if, if the outcome, if the unknown state of the world really turns out to be theta, yeah, then you're gonna, your, your model will lead to, the, to lead to a particular loss. And you're going to quantify that by a real valued loss function or negative utility function. Okay. You've now got your model, which is a prediction, is going to give me a predictive or posterior distribution on the unknown theta. Yeah, so you know, this is kind of a, a simple thing to think of is that we said about stocks. Yeah, if you're going to be, if your loss is based on the future um, value of a particular stock. And you build a probability model, yeah? A pi of theta given everything, yeah? And because it contains all the information, I'm just going to use the, the notation as well, uh, pi sub i, yeah, on theta. So this thing here denotes my best beliefs using all available information about the unknown state of the world theta or the savage's small world, theta, which enters into the loss. Sorry, savage is the, the founder uh, kind of, of Bayesian decision theory. Um, this theta i yeah, is now going to be this point in the model space. So this board now is the space of all distribution functions. Yeah, and I'm going to represent this model as this point in this space of distribution functions. There it sits. Okay. I'm worried about robustness, about all the things that went into the specification of that model. And so what I want to know is what's the worst thing that could happen to me if the predictive model is wrong. Yeah? So I believe... My current best beliefs is that theta will arise according to pi of what, well, the expected reward will be according to pi i of theta. I'm now going to define, well, it's not much of a, it's a bit of a wonky, uh, uh, whatever it is, space hopper or a ball around that, yeah, where I'm going to define some neighborhood size c, yeah, the radius. And I'm going to define this neighborhood as the callback Leibler between the unknown pi and pi i, and say this is less than or equal to c. <coughs> what I claim is that if you could perform that search over the space of all distribution functions within that constraint, and if I could select that one distribution function which gave you the worst possible outcome, it would have the following form. Yeah? So I'm going to say here, this point here, is pi, what do I use? My notation's a bit horrible. Pi star A, yeah? This is like the worst, yeah? Uh, worst thing possible. Well, worst thing within... Uh, this neighborhood, yeah, within gamma. My claim is that that distribution function has that following form. Pi star A is proportional to what's, what we're going to say is an exponentially tilted distribution function. We're going to take E to the lambda, and I'm going to put lambda as a function of C, here, to make it more explicit, times the loss function of theta, this is all exponentiated, times your original model. Okay. Why is this, why do I kind of claim that that's um, somehow intuitive? is if you look at the, the probability mass that this thing on the left-hand side puts on a state theta, it kind of takes your prediction, 
Yeah, your model says our oh, theta is going to occur with probability pi theta. <coughs> and this says, oh, you want to reweight that. Yeah? That has, I'm going to reweight that according to this reweighting schedule. And what's that reweighting schedule doing is simply put in for events theta which carry high loss, you're going to put extra additional weight on those. Yeah? Later on, we're going to see that in order to compute with this thing, there's a very natural Monte Carlo way of computing this via important sampling, which is that if you can give me samples from pi i theta, you would normally, if you were doing MCMC or Monte Carlo, you would just average the outcomes. And now I'm telling you, in order to look at robustness, you should reweight the samples, your predictive samples, with this exponential tilting function here. Okay, is that, is, are we kind of clear what's happening here? Okay, good. And so this is just the normalizing constant, okay? And we're just going to assume for now that this, that this thing is, can be normalized, of course, yeah? But you have to check, yeah? Like, intuitively, for small lambda, yeah, this will be normalizable, but you have to check. So what do I say with this lambda? I said this lambda is a monotone function of C. Yeah? As C, is, this is a hard constraint. Yeah? The kullback leibler divergence of your search space is less than C. And what I'm saying is as that C gets bigger, this lambda will increase. And you can intuitively see you're going to put more and more weight on outcomes of theta which are worse and worse for you. This is this loss function. Okay. So how do you kind of come about that proof? Well, the, the simple observation is that this constrained optimization task, I've asked you to find me the distribution function which sits within that callback leibler ball, yeah? has a Lagrange dual, which means that I can write this problem here, find me the thing within that ball, as a penalized uh, problem from the convexity of the kullback leibler divergence. Okay, so here's the, the proof to that statement here is that I can write that constrained uh, optimization problem as a penalized problem. Do people, I'm assuming a lot of people know about the lasso, have studied the lasso, people know about the lasso in machine learning. It's like where you, so if you read the original paper of the lasso, it says, oh, find me the model, yeah, where the sum of the absolute value of the coefficients is less than some constant, yeah? So the original kind of definition of the lasso was, uh, you know, kind of maximize or minimize the sum of squares of like yi minus xi beta, minimize this subject to the sum over j of the absolute value of beta j, uh, let me show you, is less than or value c. Yeah? That was the, that's the form of the lasso. Minimize the sum of squares subject to a constraint on the absolute value. And what they showed is quite nice is that that has a Lagrange dual which means actually I can just turn it around as a penalized regression problem. Yeah? I can turn this around as, well, this thing looks hard, but there's a Lagrange dual which says that actually I can say, you know, uh, set beta hat to be the arg, the min of the sum of i, y, i minus x, i beta squared plus lambda times the sum over j of the absolute values of j. Can you all see this? Yeah. So 
so the lasso said, oh, okay, we've got this hard constraint. I'm going to turn this in, and sorry, this lambda, if you really are going to need a binoculars in a minute, uh, this lambda is a function of c, yeah? As c gets big, or well, maybe the other way around, maybe it's 1 over c, yeah. 1 over c. Yeah. And all we're doing is, th we're doing the same trick here, but in a non-parametric sense, yeah? On functions, on, f on distribution functions. So we're saying that uh, if I look at that previous problem, I can write it as a minimization over an expected loss, just like the sum of squares in Lasso. For me, I've got my expected loss, which is the integral of the loss of theta times pi of theta, d theta. Yeah, so this is going to be the expected uh, loss of, of, the, of of the distribution function, yeah, and I want to I want to maximize this, or rather I want to minimize the negative loss. Yeah, so the negative loss is the reward. Yeah, I want to get my lowest possible reward, i.e., the worst possible thing that can happen to you. Yeah, but I'm not going to allow you to go too far away from my original model. Yeah, and that's the callback Leibler penalty. So it's, it's like an optimization problem yeah, over distribution functions. So lasso, you select a single coefficient beta. Here we're going to select a whole distribution function. So we're after select a distribution function that minimizes that. Well, if we just write out, and the rest is just expanding things out. So all I've done, all I've done here in the next slide is that I've explicitly written out the, what the expected loss is. And now I have this penalty on the callback leibler divergence. And then you just note that these, both these two terms are expectations with respect to the unknown pi. Yeah? So this is an expected loss. And as I said before, the callback leibler is just the expected log likelihood. Yeah, or the log probability ratio. So I'm going to collect terms. I'm just going to write these two terms as just a single expectation with respect to theta. I'm going to keep the log pi of theta there, pi i of theta here, and then to bring this in to this term here, I just have to exponentiate this and bring the lambda in. And then if you look at this line here, what is this? This is just another callback Leibler measure. So I've said, what does what is this thing that I'm trying to minimize look like? <coughs> oh, it looks like another callback Leibler divergence. Yeah? And but at this level it says find me a pi theta that minimizes the callback Leibler divergence to this object here. Kind of. Well, of course, the thing that minimizes that is going to be, is the identity. Yeah? The, in the ratio. So, hence, the worst possible distribution function that can you get hit with, within this callback Leibler constraint, has that following form. Are there any questions? Okay. So, so C, this neighborhood, or equally lambda here, has the form of a, of a level of confidence in your model. Yeah? How kind of, how, you know, how certain are you in it? So let, let's have some, I, I just want to take a, an example, or a couple of examples of this, of what happens here. Okay. First of all, so I should say that that, that that local kind of minimax distribution is, looks like an exponentially tilted density, which kind of, you know, of course, it makes sense. It says, well, the worst thing that can happen is, is to put more weight on the things that hurt you, <coughs> you know, that, are, that you ha carry high loss. So just some kind of background, you know, if that loss function is linear, this is called the well-known Escher transform that's used in actuarial science. 
if I set the lambda to be zero, or if I set my callback libel uh, neighborhood to be zero, it's like having infinite trust in your model. Yeah, so you're back to the Bayesian, the classical Bayesian paradigm then, which says, oh, I, I truly believe my model and I should follow actions according to decision theoretic approaches a la, you know, savage. As that neighborhood size grows, what you're going to do is you're going to put more and more measure on states of theta which maximize the loss. And in the limit, in a non-rigorous way, you can see that this will accumulate to be a Dirac function, a point mass on the outcome of theta, which is the worst possible thing that could happen. Yeah. So I continually add more and more weight to the, to the things that can hurt you, then of course you just you end up with all of your measure concentrated around the worst possible thing. And then you're into, this, the, into the world of Wald's minimax. Yeah? And so, again, you can see why having an unconstrained minimax solution doesn't really make much sense. You, would, you, know, you just choose, select the worst possible thing, irrespective of that the, this thing is providing you some useful information. OK, I'm going to skip over the, for time constraints, I'm going to skip over the next things, just quickly say, you know, other things we know about that is that you will lie on the ball, yeah, on the, on the shell of that ball, uh, because of the convexity of the callback Leibler. So if you increase the neighborhood size C, this pi star will move, because of course you can always put more and more measure on the, 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 the things that have carry highest loss. Uh, the other thing to note, and this is important, is by symmetry, the best possible thing that can happen to you yeah, has exactly the same form but with a negative sign here. Yeah? So the best possible thing that can happen for you is that you predict the outcomes according to <coughs> theta and you've underweighted the good stuff. Yeah, or overweighted the, the bad outcomes. Yeah. So by symmetry, the form of the best possible outcome uh, distribution function has this form. Okay. This here might ring bells. The form of that thing here might ring some bells to, for some people in the audience. And I'll, I'll draw some connections in a minute. OK, I'm not going to say there's a, a couple of properties that we have about it in terms of how big is that neighborhood in terms of properties of the, of the actual distribution. I don't want to really uh, cover this. I'm not going to go into the proof here, but this is, this is a very important fact of, you know, things that have gone into this specification. Well, we've had to define the neighborhood size, yeah? That's a natural question. How far out should you go? But there's the other question is, why use callback Leibler to define that ball? Yeah, you could use other divergence measures or other metrics yeah, to define the distance between any distribution function and your current model. And what we, sh what we have shown <coughs> is that the callback Leibler divergence is the only measure you can use. It's kind of surprising. Yeah. It's the only coherent divergence measure. Okay, so what do I mean by that statement? What I mean is that uh, by coherency, I mean that it's invariant to the, to the presentation of the information or the data. So here's a concrete example. Suppose I split the room in two, yeah? So you guys on, on the, my left sit the, in the room and you sit there. You both start off with the same prior model. Yeah? So you're going to have exactly the same model. You guys, I'm going to give all of the data in one big chunk. I'm going to give you a bucket of data and you're going to update and you're going to tell me, you're going to calculate this object here. Yeah? So you're going to update, you're going to get pi i theta and then you're going to tell me the worst possible outcome. Okay? 
You guys over here, I'm going to give you a single datum, one data point. You get all of the data. You get one data point, and you're going to update. Yeah? You're going to update to give me a pi star a, but based on one datum. You're going to update using to pi star a using all of the data. You're now going to take your pi star a, and I'm going to give you another data, and another datum, and another datum, until you've got all of the data. Yeah? For coherency, your pi star a and your pi star a must match. Yeah? Because you've got the same prior, you've got the same bucket of information, the same bucket of data. Yeah? It would be incoherent if you ended up with saying that you know, your minimax density was different to yours. Yeah? What we've shown is that the callback library is the only G divergence, formerly the only uh, divergence measure that provides that. Okay. Following that thought process backwards means that, you know, I said, you're going to update, I give you one datum, you update and then you go forward and, and I give you all of the data. Well, what happens if I give you no data and ask you to update? Yeah. So I'm now going to give you no data and ask you to update. This is still a valid update. You start off with a prior. It's still your best beliefs. This is just your best beliefs about the unknown value. I give you no data, then that's a prior. You can still find me the worst possible thing that could happen within a callback libel ball of your prior. Then I'm going to start giving you data. And you two are going to end up at the same position by coherency. Yeah. So it is as if... I could apply this operator, this exponential reweighted a priori, yeah, before you've seen the data. So in other words, this thing here relates to a rather wordy local minimax robust prior. And that was the connection that was made between the question that was earlier. It's like, should you apply this thing a posteriori? when this is a predictive model using all of the data and all of the prior, or should you think of it a priori as a robust prior? And I'm saying that for coherency, it, those two things have to match in some sense. Yeah, the callback libel is the only divergence measure that will give you that coherent matching. And so you can think about this as a kind of either as a robust posterior or a robust prior. It, in, in some sense, it doesn't, you're led to the same conclusion. OK, um, so we've defined uh, what we mean by robustness now. We formally defined it. What I mean by robustness is the worst possible thing uh, that can happen within this neighborhood, uh, defined in, under this callback libel of divergence measure. And that callback libel of divergence is the only measure that's going to give me coherency of updating. So what does an example look like? Let's take through a concrete example. So. You've got, your, you've got your, your machine learning model or your statistical model, and the task is to provide a predictive distribution. Okay, so it's just a well-defined task in machine learning well, and in statistics. So you've been given some data, and you've got to provide your boss with a prediction for some future event. And I'm going to put a hat on this just to denote. So what, I'm going to, what you're going to have to do is you're going to provide me with a predictive distribution. Yeah? Uh, a hat, that means that you've got to give me your best prediction for a future outcome y given a future x. Okay. So what I've said is that I need a way of scoring. Yeah, I need a loss function of scoring your prediction against what actually happens. Yeah? So, for example, if I ask you to give me the prediction could be the survival time of a, of a patient yeah, following a treatment. Now, you, you provide me with a full distribution for their survival time. I'm going to see one outcome, and I want to be able to grade you. Yeah? What's your, what, in some sense, formally, what should you report to me? Yeah? In order to remain... This ties in very much with Bayesian theory, kind of internally honest, yeah? So you have to provide me with your best prediction, yeah? In order to ensure 
that it's a fair game, that you do provide me with your best prediction, there are what's called scoring rules. Yeah? In decision theory, there are things called scoring rules that ensure that you provide your honest beliefs. Yeah? And so the local proper scoring rule for a predictive distribution or for a distribution says use the log loss. Yeah? I take the log of the probability of what was actually observed, yeah? evaluated under your predictive density. Yeah? So suppose you provide me a prediction of a stock price which is Gaussian, and then I see the stock price at some point in the future. It says I should penalize you by the log of the Gaussian, so something like the, the weighted sum of the squared difference. Yeah. But formally, it says, oh, the, the, f like the local proper scoring rule for evaluating the loss that arises from an unknown outcome under your distribution, you should take the log likelihood or the log predictive density. Yeah? <clears throat> so if you do that, well, of course, what's the standard Bayesian solution says, if I need to provide you with a predictive distribution, I should just take the marginal. Yeah? So here we have to be, remember I said that here theta relates to every state of nature for which you are going to get rewarded or rewards on or losses, the same thing. Yeah? And so here, this is your predictive distribution on the unknown state of nature theta. So here I've just with notation, this would be your pi of y given x and theta. And it's a marginal. Yeah? Your Bayesians, you fit your model, you've integrated everything out, and you're providing me with the best predictive. Okay. So the standard Bayesian solution, of course, is provide the marginal distribution. I provide that the central point there. However, and this is what I've argued for the, the last bit of period of time, which is that assumes the model's correct. And everything that's gone into the model represents your best beliefs. You know, you've, you're internally calibrated on the prior and the likelihood, and et cetera, et cetera. Moreover, and this is one of the points I put in very early on in the, the first slide of the first lecture, and I think this is an increasingly kind of important aspect, is that not only assumes that the model is right, but it assumes that the data that you're predicting on is being generated in some sense under the same distribution as the data you're going to be applying the method in. Yeah? Like in st statistics, we tend to call that about kind of ascertainment bias. Yeah? My training data is different to the environment or the data where I'm actually going to be applying the model. Yeah? This is, I believe, increasingly important aspect in machine learning and statistics. Yeah? The world is changing, of course, rapidly, especially in terms of like data capture and data measurements. So the data sets which, which you train your machine learning models on will have, will have slight differences to the data that you're predicting on. Yeah? By natural, you know, of course, yeah, the world changes. Yeah? You know, the world is not stable. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, it means that, that this model is in some sense slightly miscalibrated. Yeah? There's a notion here they call concept drift, I think in data mining, which is, you know, there's a shelf life yeah? uh, to the model. So, so let's play the game of the, you know, how does the robust uh, model cope with this? Well, what does the local minimax solution look like? It says, well, we take your original predictive distribution, which is pi y of x, and I'm going to do this exponential tilting by the loss function. So here I'm just going to tilt the log loss function, which for us is the log probability distribution. It's an exponentiated, so of course it just comes down, and we have the following form. So what does this, what does this look like? Well, this looks like a tempered distribution. Yeah, if you know about tempering, it's like heating up. It's like raising, you take your distribution function, you raise it to some power, and then you renormalize it. Okay? And what we know is that if you do that, it'll flatten out the modes. If you take a distribution function, you raise it to 
uh, you know, some power less than one, and then renormalize, we know that it's going to lift the valleys, yeah, or lift the troughs, and put more mass in the tails and lower the, the hills. Yeah? In other words, it's going to increase the entropy. Yeah. <coughs> so this leads to a tempered distribution with fatter tails, smooths the modes. So what we what we've seen formally is that predictive tempering arises as this kind of decision theoretic solution to prediction under model misspecification. So if you worry about model misspecification yeah, and you're providing predictions, heat, the, heat your predictions slightly. Yeah? The way you should heat them, the amount that you should heat them is based in this kind of an idea of a local trust region. There's a, yeah. What is a good price? <laughs> So that's the million dollar <laughs> uh, question, is what's a good choice of lambda? So in, um, in Hansen's book, uh, for the Gaussian state space model, what they talk about is neighborhoods which are almost indistinguishable. Yeah? So in other words, as I change lambda, this pi star a changes. And you want some kind of intuitive measure of how far away have I gone from my original pi. And so the way that they frame that is using a p-value and said, if I did a non-parametric test, yeah, suppose I was trying to just test whether my data came from pi star a or from pi i, yeah, how much information is there to distinguish those things? So what's the kind of the p-value? Yeah? So if this moves away, as this pi star a moves further and further away from pi i, then you should, they, it, in some sense, it's more and more, it should be more clearly distinguishable. So that's one formal way of doing it. For our purposes, we very much think of this as qualitative model checking. So my recommendation would be to explore this in a neighborhood and actually just plot out what these marginals look like. Just visualize them, yeah? If they look very similar, yeah, yet the, 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 loss is, the loss change is huge, it suggests that there's quite a strong imbalance between your model and the, and the, the kind of the loss function, yeah? And so you should be aware of that. And then it's just all about what's good applied statistics. Go back in, check your model, you know, make sure that you're confident with the things that enter in, uh, the assumptions that you've <coughs> underpinned it. Uh, underpin it. Okay. Um, there's a, given the time, <laughs> there's a connection here as well with something called packed Bayesian approaches. Okay. Which is, remember I said about the coherency argument, which means that this could be played a priori. Yeah. If we play this game a priori, suppose that I give you I've given you, you've got a prior belief about an object. Yeah? I'm now going to give you some data, but you don't know how to construct the likelihood function. Yeah? When would that ever, what's an example of that? Think about the question that I asked about estimating the median. Yeah? So you've got very, very good prior beliefs about the median. Yeah, it's the same. Suppose you've got pretty good prior beliefs about what the median is of a distribution function, say the lifetime survival rates of cancer patients. Yeah? And I'm going to give you some data, and now if you're going to crank the Bayesian handle, you need to give me a likelihood, a sampling distribution. That's hard in general. Yeah? Because all you wanted to do, all I asked you was about the median. Yeah? I just want information about the median. So actually specifying that jo joint model could be problematic. So in that sense, you can start off with a prior as your point here and ask, you know, what's the best possible match to the data without having to specify a likelihood function in this region? And then that gives me the infimum, which would be the negative in here. Yeah. You need... it. It need to kind of it takes time to think about it, but there's a connection here to what's called packed Bayesian approaches. 
In terms of, uh, I'm, I, again, I give you some literature uh, uh, into Pat Bayesian. This is a very nice review paper, tutorial paper by Langford. But what I'm saying is you can interpret these methods, such as Pat Bayesian approaches, under these kind of local decision theoretic rules. OK, uh, I'm just looking at the time and where I want to go. Um, I do, yeah, I should definitely cover this. How are we going to do this in practice? Yeah, so I said, oh, um, you know, we've got this local minimax thing. If we're doing prediction, take your distribution and heat it. Yeah, okay, that's all well and good. What happens if theta is very high dimensional? Yeah, which is, you know, entirely plausible. You could have a very kind of high dimensional object. You know, how can I kind of work with this system? Well, to do that, we went to the world of computational statistics. And I know that you've done, you've done some classes on Monte Carlo methods. Yeah? So the basis of Monte Carlo methods is the following. If you're interested in calculating a functional or an expectation of interest, the way that you do this is you draw some theta rise from your model. And then I just take averages. Yeah. That's this kind of standard. So, so uh, the stuff you did with Mark, you would have talked to you about drawing the how to draw these theta rise. Use MCMC, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods to draw a sequence of theta rise from the model. Then plug those samples and take empirical averages in order to find out the value of something of interest. So, if I think of this in this world, I no longer have a rep of like a, I no longer have an analytic representation of pi i theta. Yeah. What I'm going to have is a bag of samples representation. Yeah. So what I have is a set of theta i's from i equals 1 to t where each theta i is drawn from this central kind of probability, marginal, yeah? So I'm going to say, if, you just, if I've just got a bag of samples, you know, how can I proceed? Because this is pretty general, you know, most methods now can provide me some kind of with computational uh, statistics. We can provide, you know, samples from these models, yeah? Well, the standard approach to calculating would be you just take the, the empirical average. And so what, I, what you note here is just, you know, trivially, I can write this standard Monte Carlo as a weighted average where the weights are just uniform. Yeah? You just draw your samples from the posterior marginal here, and then you just take averages on the quantity of interest, the loss function. What happens in the robust approach is that it's like a retrospective. Uh, you apply afterwards reweighting of your Monte Carlo samples. So no longer is Wi equal to 1 over n. Yeah. What we're going to do is we're going to set the Wi's deterministically as these reweighted with weighting function proportional to the expected to the loss. Yeah. What I've talked about today is about doing that deterministically. Yeah? So it's a deterministic reweighting. The way you could calculate this is with a deterministic reweighting of your Monte Carlo samples. And that tells me something very strong about the local minimax within this Kullback Leibniz. Yeah? What I'm not going to have time to talk to you about is that we could also think about jiggling these weight, jiggling, yeah, all, yeah, moving the weights stochastically. That's the other natural thing, is that the other kind of natural question is, well, you know, why look at the worst possible outcome, yeah? Why not look at the, you know, the distribution of, of things that happen within there, the average loss, you know? Actually, we spent, I must admit, we spent a long time thinking about the average loss, and of course, if this ball is symmetric, the average loss is just the same as this thing. But it took us a little bit of time to work that out, rather stupidly. But uh, you could look at the distribution of loss within that ball, yeah? And that could be interesting. Oh, look, what are the quantiles of loss? Yeah, what's the median loss within this ball? What's the, 
90th percentile of loss. This is, in certain sense, the 100th percentile. Yeah, it's the worst possible loss that could happen with him. And so, and so to do that by kind of averaging within that ball, we would want to sample those weights stochastically. And again, it's this idea of shaking your model. But it's quite nice that it says, well, you know, standard Monte Carlo, if you really trust your model, sets the weights deterministically, yeah, as it should do, yeah, as defined. If, you're, if you take robustness into account, you should add, you know, perturb these weights and look at what happens. If you perturb the weights a little bit, yeah, and things dramatically change, you should be worried, yeah. And that's, I think that kind of captures this notion of, of adding noise into your model by, kind of, by, by injecting noise into those weights, either deterministically or stochastically. Um, there are very close connections with notions of Bayesian non-parametrics in terms of shaking that model stochastically, because what we're then after is sampling distribution functions within the space of distribution functions i.e. you want to put a measure on a space of probability measures. Yeah, and that's, that's classically an area in Bayes non-parametrics, and um, there are very close connections here. Uh, given the time constraints, well, <laughs> uh, just a couple of minutes left, I'm going to skip all over uh, that part, um, but just to say that it, um, it's another way of thinking about the robustness issue here. Uh, and these are the slides which, uh, if you blink, I'll, I'll go straight through that describe all of that. <coughs> he uses notion of, uh, notions of Dirichlet processes, which are ways of constructing distributions on spaces of distributions. Okay, and so we construct these Dirichlet processes kind of centered around the current best model and then look at variation. Okay. Um, I've got some, some examples, worked examples through here. Again, I would just say, given time, just you know, feel free to go through the slides. Drop me an email if anything's kind of not clear. Hopefully, it should be kind of fairly uh, um, fairly straightforward, given that you understand the kind of the underlying theory of what's happening. So we looked at some variable regression problems where their costs cost you to measure something. Yeah, to ask a question costs you something. And then the question is, which variables should you go and select? What measurements should you take? We looked at problems in that. Uh, we looked at issues in screening designs, in breast cancer screening designs. Yeah? When is the optimal time to start, uh, uh, to start screening of women? And how often should one screen? Yeah? And again, the problem is, is that you define these Markov-type models in order to answer those questions. But they're critically dependent on all of these distribution functions. So here we say patients start in A, they can go to a preclinical disease in B, which is undetected. They can go to a clinical disease C, which is detected, and they can die. Yeah? And what you're after is what's the optimal intervention strategy in order to maximize the expected kind of overall utility, i.e. preventing death at a cost of the, against the cost of actually implementing the strategy. And any question that you ask about that is based on these, knowing these distribution functions which you don't know. And so we've used these kind of techniques to explore robust screening designs within this context of, of Markov processes, uh, which is contained there. OK, uh, two slides of summary. Um, so what I hope to have captured over these last couple of lectures is that checking robustness and sensitivity of answers is, is a key component of modern data analysis. It's really, in some sense, not acceptable not to, to try and break your models. Yeah? That's what I say. Like, if you find an interesting result, try and break it. Yeah? If you build a model, you know, shake it up. Yeah? Um, in the Bayesian approach, we can explore this formally through classes of distribution functions around the models. In terms of computational approaches, we can implement these by re-weighted Monte Carlo samples, either deterministically to get minimax or the stuff I haven't talked about using Bayesian non-parametric measures to do stochastic re-weighting. And the other thing we showed here is, that co is or was mentioned, is that callback library is the only coherent divergence measure that one can use to define those neighborhood functions. 
There's many areas that I haven't gone over. Uh, there's, we have a recent paper on archive which pulls out a lot of the references and discusses a lot of the background to this in terms of the other <coughs> literature. So kind of take-home messages, optimal actions and decisions are conditional on your models. Okay, you're providing your models, you're putting your models out there into the world. People are going to do things with them. Yeah? This is a kind of a decision theory space. If your models are approximations to reality, then so are the answers and the decisions that are made using the models. Okay. This is compounded from the fact that we're in this world of big data and complex um, dependencies. There's an increasing rise in the use of approximate models, variational Bayes, ABC, INLA, composite likelihoods. This merits a reappraisal. We really need to think carefully about Bayesian robustness. And statisticians should be sensitive to the stability of our conclusions or answers. And so, as I said, this rather glib kind of take-home message is, you know, you know, shake your model and look at the stability of what happened. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> Do we have any uh, questions? I'm sorry, I've overrun a bit. Hi, yeah. This data set, and we, we're going to be, we're gonna, you're worried about being able to cover the outliers in this data set. Uh, and I guess mostly the demographics of the data sets are similar, like this maybe breast cancer data set, it's mm -hmm. got a number of dimensions, and a normal number of samples that we deal with. Uh, if we, if you're interested in having a model that is able to tune itself to different demographics, demographics of data set, mm. say a high dimension <coughs> with low number of samples, mm. or a multi-dimensional with many samples. So it, would, that, would, would you refer that also as robustness, or is it a different topic? So there's a, a question about kind of adaptive models, and uh, about if you have a model that can accommodate or adapt to different uh, data scenarios, do we count that as robust? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there are, there, there are kind of two aspects here. There's, there's, you know, it's always a good idea to build robustness into your models, yeah, via like heavy-tailed, say, sampling distributions or allowing for hierarchies that can capture what we'd say heterogeneity, the fact that there's differences between different data. Um, what, what we kind of talk here is about what I call is or it's called ex post robustness. After everything that you've done, yeah, you've done your best possible things. I thought, okay, I'm going to build in the robust likelihood. I'm going to think about the ascertainment bias in my data. I'm going to think about how my operating environment for the model might differ from the training environment to the model. And I've put that all in, yeah. But you still might be concerned or you still might you know you know occupy your mind slightly is that you know there's still a lot of assumptions that's gone into there. I've done the best possible thing I can but you know I think it be it makes sense to as well explore because if I t if I told you that you only you know you've done your best possible thing you can but actually you only have to move a little bit in model space and your results change or your conclusions change change dramatically. So I think there's, there's um, you know, certainly it's always a good thing to try and build robustness into your models. You know, replacing Gaussians with students and, uh, you, know, uh, uh, b you know, taking into account heterogeneity in the data. But at the end of the day, yeah, there's this additional level of kind of uncertainty in assumptions that I think is useful to take care of or useful to explore.